All right. So before I start my presentation, uh, I would like to show you a physical book again. This book came out last year from the University of Hawaii Press. So it's been about a bit over a year since it came out originally. And thankfully enough people bought it so that the paperback edition also came out just last month, uh, more affordable. So what is this book about? Um, well, as the title indicates, the title is Agents of World Renewal, The Rise of Yonawish Gods in Japan. Uh, the book deals with the idea or the concept of world renewal or yonawashi in Japanese. And my um, book looks at how this concept became widespread in early modern Japanese society starting in the late 18th century. And my basic argument is that uh, one way in which this discourse became manifest in Japanese society was through these gods, these divinities that were invested with the power or authority to renew the world or to execute yonaoshi in different segments of Japanese society. And I'm calling these um, entities yonaoshi gods in this book. Right? So I have about 15 minutes to, uh, to 20 minutes to introduce this book to you. So I, to do that, I'd like to share my screen now. And I hope you can see my screen. Okay, very good. So um, to uh, give you a sense of what this book is about, I, I'm organizing my section or my talk into two sections. First, I'd like to uh, give you a concrete example of the Yonao Shigat to give you a sense of what I'm, what kinds of entities I'm talking about, and then move on to discuss my methodology a little more broadly. Okay, so. Let me give you a concrete example. Uh, for that, we go to 1784. That's the fourth year of Tenmei, third month, 24th day. We are in the city of Edo, uh, the shogun's capital, the capital of the Tokugawa shogunate, uh, Japan's early modern period. And on this particular day, uh, a major political scandal happens in the city of Edo. Uh, a low ranking samurai by the name of Sano Zen Zaimon. Uh, who was working as a guard at Edo Castle, attacks and kills one of the highest government ranking officials at the time, junior elder Tanuma Okitomo. Uh, Sano attacked Tanuma with a sword. He slashed Tanuma in the shoulder. Uh, Tanuma sustained heavy injuries and died a few days later. And this news uh, sent shockwaves throughout uh, the city of Edo uh, because of its violent nature of course the incident happened inside Edo castle right at the heart of the Tokugawa shogunate people of Edo uh, received this news with uh, you know much excitement and how did they react to this incident this was a major political scandal but it seems that people of Edo were pretty happy about this whole situation uh, because it seems that everybody hated the Tanma uh, family and the, the reason why I bring up the family is that this person who was attacked Tanuma Okitomo was the eldest son of per someone who was perhaps the most politically powerful person in Japan at the time, uh, Tanuma Okitsugu, who was elder, uh, serving as elder in the Tokugawa shogunate. And the people of Edo, they had this deep resentment towards the Tanuma dynasty uh, at the time because they were thought to be uh, extremely corrupt. They were thought to be nepotistic. Uh, they were thought to prosper off of bribes. Um, Tanuma Okitsugu had introduced a number of new taxes uh, that were very unpopular in Edo at the time. And Japan in the 1780s or, or early 70s, 1780s were going through this period of economic stagnation. And many people had regarded the, the corrupt Tanuma dynasty as uh, a, a leading factor contributing to their suffering. So according to this one document, uh, record of incidents involving swords since the Kanye period. Yes, there is such a record. Uh, this document record one of the how people reacted to this incident. Uh, upon hearing the news of Tanuma Okitomo being attacked with a sword, both samurai and townspeople were ecstatic. So really happy. People especially praised Sano Zen Zaimon. This is because they all detested the Tanuma family. People's hearts were all the same. So the people of Edo were pretty happy about this, uh, but Sano, of course, was arrested uh, for this crime. Um, he was interrogated. His motives remained unclear. Uh, he was most likely motivated by uh, his personal grudge towards 
Kanama Okitomo. Uh, but in any case, he was uh, ordered to commit seppuku, ritual suicide. And he died about 10 days after the original incident. And his remains were taken to his family temple, uh, this temple called Tokufonji in Asakusa, which is uh, still there today in Tokyo. Uh, a funeral was conducted there and his remains were placed uh, inside a grave site over here, still in Asakusa today. And then something interesting happens. Uh, shortly after Sano's death, uh, the price of rice in Edo drops all of a sudden. The, the price of rice had skyrocketed in the previous years and had been one of the major causes of economic struggles for the people of Edo. But then the price of rice drops all of a sudden after Sano dies. And the people of Edo interpret this as a blessing made possible through Sano's actions and his sacrifice ultimately. And they gather around Sano's gravesite to venerate him as a world renewing god, or as a Yona Oshitai Myojin more specifically. And Sano's deification is recorded in a number of contemporaneous documents. Uh, but here's one example, uh, this memoir type writing by Suita Genbaku, of course, the famous Dutch studies uh, scholar. He writes about this incident. On the day after this person, Sano Zenzaimon, died, the price of the five grains dropped slightly. So Genbaku says five grains, but other sources simply say rice. Because of this, foolish individuals gathered together and said, oh, how precious, how grateful must we be this person is not a human, he is a god. He manifested himself in this world in order to save us. They gathered every day at a temple called Tokuhonji in Asakusa Honganji, uh, where Zen Zaimon's remains were placed. It is said that people visit the temple continuously in a large number like a group of ants and they worship him incessantly as a great illustrious god of world renewal, Yonao Shitai Myoji. So Genpak sounds, uh, critical of people worshiping Sano, but he gives us an interesting contemporaneous account of, of this deification. This, and this is the first example that I was able to find where a particular entity, a particular individual is deified or upheld as a Yonaoshi god, as, as a superhuman agent of world renewal. And this marks the beginning of the prominence of Yonaoshi gods in Japanese society. And this case study, I think, is interesting for a number of different uh, reasons. First, it shows us uh, the vision, a vision of Yona Oshi that is outside of the Bakumatsu period, the mid 19th century. I think most people in Japanese studies today associate the idea of world renewal with the mid 19th century, with the Meiji Restoration specifically. I think the narrative goes something like, you know, towards the end of the Tokuga period, people are becoming dissatisfied with the Tokuga feudal order. Uh, there were these calls for popular calls for world renewal, you know, a new world order, uh, something completely new. And this popular subversive energy contributed to the uh, maturation or completion of the Meiji Restoration or something like that, right? That is typically the narrative, but this case, this case study, once again, comes from 1784, which shows that this idea of Yonao, she had a much longer lifespan than we, we tend to think. And secondly, uh, this is also an example of Yona Oshi outside of the framework of millenarianism. And this is related to my first point, but uh, in many Japanese history textbooks, Japanese religions textbooks, Yona Oshi is described as this millenarian concept signifying radical cataclysmic, complete destruction of the present world and the rise of this you know, new uh, world order. And that's typically, and in and, and this, Tendency is particularly strong, I think, in English language scholarship, the, the way to this tendency to describe Yonaoshi as a millenarian. But once again, the 1784 example uh, didn't really have anything to do with this apocalyptic, you know, radical transformation of the world. It mostly had to do with the price of rice, uh, this concrete economic challenge that the people of Edo at the time were facing. And lastly, this example helps to illustrate the significance of Yonaoshi in Japanese religions. Um, I, I argue that these Yonaoshi gods became pretty ubiquitous in early modern Japanese society, but they have been largely ignored in the traditional historiography of Japanese religions. So I'd like to, uh, once again, highlight their importance in, in this book project. Okay. Now a little bit about my methodology, how I'm approaching 
this concept of Yona Oshi overall and how it uh, contributes to my overall project. Um, one methodological intervention I'm making in this book is to clearly distinguish between Yona Oshi as an ethic category and Yona Oshi as an emic concept articulated by historical actors themselves. And this is where it gets a little tricky, but um, let me try to make sense of it somehow. So th there are dozens of books. There are many books written on the subject of Yonaoshi in, in Japanese. There are many books written about Yonaoshi uprisings, Yonaoshi consciousness, Yonaoshi movements, many, many books on, on, on the subject. But what's happening in these books is that it, it's the scholars who are using this expression Yonaoshi to, to talk about certain historical movements, certain historical phenomena. Like what, what's happening in these books about Yonaoshi typically is that scholars are classifying or labeling retroactively certain movements or phenomena as Yonaoshi movements based on a number of analytical rubrics, mostly informed by Marxist rubrics like class struggle, revolution, anti-authoritarianism, and so forth. So it's their term. It's, it's the scholars using this term to refer to certain historical phenomena. And that is quite different or has very little to do with, I argue, with the emic conception of Yonaoshi as articulated by or invoked by uh, historical actors themselves. The, the, the expression Yonaoshi that we find in primary sources, basically. And what makes this situation complicated or confusing is that over the years, I think scholars have become uh, somewhat uh, lax or, or lazy, perhaps, in, in, in sort of not distinguishing between the ethic Yonaoshi and the emic Yonaoshi, which are very two different things. And what's even more problematic is the tendency to project uh, some of the qualities associated with the edit category of Yonaoshi onto the emic conception of Yonaoshi. So there's this conflation of these two very different usages of the, the expression Yonaoshi in scholarship, I think. So today in Japanese studies, I think most people have this um, vague understanding of Yonaoshi as, have, as have, having something to do with uh, class struggle, revolution, millenarianism, uh, subversion. But my intervention, uh, admittedly a very nerdy intervention, is to say, well, which Yonaoshi are you talking about? Are you talking about the etic Yonaoshi or the emic Yonaoshi? And if you're talking about the emic Yonaoshi, well, we actually don't know. Uh, there hasn't been much study uh, on, on the emic conception of Yonaoshi and the historical development of Yonaoshi as, uh, as, as a concept in its own sort of original historical context. So what I do in this book, in my book, is to focus exclusively on the emic conception of Yonaoshi and particularly focus on the question of, is it really millenarian? Is the emic conception of Yonaoshi, does it qualify or does it really count as millenari millenarianism? Because that is often the way uh, scholars working in English mostly uh, describe this, uh, this concept. And of course, I'm focusing on these gods because one clear pattern that I noticed is that whenever a historical actor invokes Yonaoshi, uh, again, in the emic sense, there's usually a supernatural entity that has the authority to bring, bring about or to execute Yonaoshi. So that's, that is my analytical lens going, going into this project. And here's what I found. What I found is that in the Tokugawa period, world renewal, this idea of Yonaoshi, doesn't really have anything to do, with, to do with this apocalyptic, cataclysmic transformation of the world. Rather, it has more to do with this more localized revitalization of individual communities. And this revitaliza revitalization process was based on rectification of specific concrete economic injustices or perceived economic injustices including things like the high prices of rice and other goods and unfair or unreasonable taxation practices in, in the respective locales. And then this, uh, this economic aspect, I think, has been um, uh, lacking or uh, can benefit from more attention from, from the scholars. And I'm also emphasizing the, this aspect of economic salvation as a central or vital aspect of early modern Japanese religions. These Yonaoshi gods, in essence, were divine rectifiers of economic injustices. So I start this book 
uh, once again, I opened this book with the example of Sano Masa uh, Zenzaimo uh, and his apotheosis deification that had mostly to do with the price of rice, right? And then I move on to talk about a number of peasant protests that took place in the mid to late Tokuga period in which the peasants uh, described themselves as kami of Yonaoshi or gods of Yonaoshi to legitimate their projects. And one point I want to make clear is that the, the uprisings that I'm talking about in this chapter are not the so-called Yonaoshi uprising that scholars in Japan have talked about. That's their own term referring to specific kinds of uprisings based on their own criteria. I'm talking about protests in which the peasants themselves describe their objectives as Yonaoshi, two different things. I also look at cases where Tokuga bureaucrats, Baku officials get deified as Yonaoshi gods. Um, and this is an important uh, chapter for my argument because th these are government officials who implemented poverty relief measures in their respective communities. And for, for that benevolent governance, they were deified as Yonaoshi gods. This guy on the right, Suzuki Chikara in particular, is, he was from the Fukui domain. He was a city magistrate in the area. He was instrumental in removing, eliminating the certain unpopular taxation practices in the, in the region. And for as 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 a show of gratitude, the, the residents of the region dedicated a shrine in his honor, calling it World Renewal Shrine. And if we hold on to this idea that Yonaoshi has something to do with again millenarianism, subversion, anti-authoritarianism, the deification of these Baku officials would make would make any sense. All right. So I'm, again, we have to distinguish the emic from etic. And I also talk about this major earthquake that happened in 1855 uh, and uh, how that earthquake led to the production of these prints called catfish prints based on this folklore that earthquakes were caused by uh, a giant catfish living underneath Japan. And here you see people being upset with the catfish for causing the earthquake. But in some of the prints, the catfish is upheld as uh, as a hero, as, as, a, as a sort of a, uh, supernatural entity sent by the gods to punish the hoarding rich and to destroy their wealth through the earthquake so that their wealth, their hoarded wealth could circulate more uh, readily in society. So in these prints, the catfish enjoys status as a world renewing deity, uh, so to speak. And then Jennifer uh, was kind enough to forward me these wonderful images uh, from, uh, from her project uh, on the Kanto earthquake in 1923. I can't do you know, full justice to you know, these wonderful images, uh, but it seems that these prints share the theme of you know, the earthquake being interpreted as, uh, as a sort of a, a way to rectify or uh, correct certain social injustices existing in, um, in, in Japanese society in the early 20th century. And the image of the catfish was very much alive uh, then as well. So I think a comparative project looking at these prints from 1855 and sort of looking, looking at them in comparison to the 1923 prints would, or images would, would be a worthwhile project. So I look at these uh, uh, projects from the Tokuga period and I'm going to skip a few examples here, but I also have a chapter, uh, uh, a segment of the book talking about the modern period and how the discourse of Yonaoshi continues to be influential into the modern period. And it, it is in the modern period that in fact, Yonaoshi does de get, get developed or does become into a fully millenarian conception. And it takes place within uh, the context of new religions, most notably in this new religion, Omoto, uh, based on the prophecy of Deguchi Nao, uh, who prophesized about the reconstruction and renewal of the world. Uh, this is in fact, an apocalyptic radical destruction of the present world of evil and the emergence of uh, a paradise on earth, uh, so to speak, uh, presided over by this messianic deity uh, who in Omoto is known as the golden god of the Northeast, Ushitura no Konji. So what I do in this book is to trace the development of this idea of world renewal from the early modern period and to the early 20th century and to highlight how this concept uh, manifested in, in specific context, how it changed over time, how it took place both within the context of institutionalized religions like Buddhist temples and also uh, uh, non-institutionalized religion or where you know, these veneration would happen more 
uh, spontaneously, so to speak. And I just like to end by showing you the table of contents here. Uh, wasn't able to talk about all of the examples, but I do have a chapter on uh, Asia Nica, uh, which I think is the latest thing written about Asia Nica. I think I could be wrong, uh, but that might be of interest to people. Um, and once again, if the way you present late Tokyo history is one where you talk about these popular millenarian calls for world renewal, uh, and that helped to defeat the Tokugawa regime. Uh, well, my book helps to problematize that narrative. And anyone interested in millenarianism, I think, would also find this book interesting. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. Uh, and then one last point I'd like to make is, once again, the book is available as hardcover and paperback. And there's nothing wrong with purchasing two copies of the book. Because here's what you can do with two copies of this book. You take one copy, you take the other copy and turn it around, and then you put them together and you can complete the catfish puzzle. Okay, thank you very much. I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Takashi. I wanna turn it over now, um, maybe starting with um, Gideon Fujiwara, if you'd like to open up the discussion. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Christina and CJR for having having me. Uh, it's always nice to be back at UBC, uh, where I have many friends and mentors. Uh, congratulations, uh, Takashi, uh, on a very, uh, just a splendid book. Uh, it was a pleasure to review your book as well. Uh, and I, I found the book uh, very rich intellectually. Uh, you're dealing obviously with very serious economic and, and social topics. But the sources that you're analyzing are, are full of uh, satire and humor, uh, you know, which really make it uh, an interesting read. And again, just the range of documents, official documents, songs, uh, print media, prophecies, uh, and some very visually stimulating uh, images. Uh, so I enjoyed it very much. So I have one question uh, that I'll begin with, uh, Takashi. So, You've offered a very persuasive argument that adds uh, clarity to our understandings of Yonaoshi, world renewal, millenarianism, activism, and deifications. So can you share with us a little bit more about your behind the scenes journey that uh, led you to, to your conclusions? Okay, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for that question. So I, I, I started this project thinking that um, you know, I'm okay. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for that question. So I, I, I started this project thinking that um, you know I'm writing a, a book, or I, I guess a, you know this is based on my dissertation. So you know, uh, part. So my attitude going in was you know I, I initially became interested in the subject of Yonaoshi. Because of its uh, because of its association with millenarianism, I was originally interested in studying millenarian movements. Um, so I started working on this project, thinking, "Oh yes, this is going to be a major project, uh, illuminating this you know um, uh, conception of world renewal as a sort of a Japanese version of millenar millenarianism or, or or a manifestation of millenarian thinking or conception in the Japanese context." But then I, as I started you know, digging into the primary sources, the, the more I looked, the less millenarianism I found. Uh, so it took a lot of uh, sort of reconceptualizing of my uh, uh, preconceived assumptions about what Yonaoshi is supposed to be. You know, I, I started out this project sort of doing the exact thing that I now criticize people for doing, you know, so projecting this millenarian reading onto primary sources. I was going reading these primary sources thinking that, okay, Yonaoshi has, has to be a millenarian thing. So how, how can I make sense of this, uh, uh, you know, sort of this discrepancy between what I thought Yonaoshi was about and what I was seeing in the primary source. So at one point I, I, I just, this lightning hit me and I, you know, I, I, I said to myself, okay, I have to basically forget everything I've read about Yonaoshi so far. And then kind of, um, be true to the sources, you know, I don't mean to sound, sound naive, you know, it's like I can, you know, uh, understand Yonaoshi in exactly the same way that people in the Edo period understand and understood it, you know, so that that is a methodological concern, but sort of, you know, understanding Yonaoshi in its own context. Um, that was, 
it, it took a while for me to be able to take that methodological turn. Once again, I, I wanted to write on millenarianism because that, would have, that was you know, what I was interested in. Um, and I, I am still interested in, in millenarian movements and I was, I, I'm glad I was able to talk about it in the last chapter of the book at least, but much of this project was really about uh, rectifying or amending my own preconceived notions of what UNLSG was supposed to be and then the reality uh, that was presented through the sources that I was able to encounter in the book uh, as part of my research, yeah. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, Takashi, I just want to congratulate you as well. It, it really is a terrific book and a, and a great read. I really enjoyed it. Um, um, not least because uh, it's nice to find a fellow appreciator and advocate of the catfish. Uh, we, I think we both have identified with this as uh, this catfish as an alter ego at, at different times. And uh, it, it is really very compelling. So I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that because of the persistence of this allegorical symbol that continues to have this world rectifying role, even into the modern period, it, it itself is kind of lobbied against modernity. And in one of those images that I had sent you, it's, it's even used to castigate the modern girl, the, the modern woman, the new woman, and very much um, still in, in force in 1923. So I just wondered if we could have a little conversation about this really continuously um, interesting and provocative allegorical symbol. Yes, thank you. And thank you again for the great images that you uh, shared with me. W one noticeable difference that, that I that caught my attention was that the 1855 catfish prints are sort of embedded in this world of mythology. In, in other words, there is this kami at Kashima Shrine in, in Ibaraki that, that's supposed to uh, be in control of a catfish. And then this, this, cat, this kami basically sends the catfish as his sort of uh, representative to rectify the world on his behalf. So almost all the catfish prints uh, reference this uh, background story or background mythology uh, pretty pretty directly, pretty explicitly. And so that the readers were, I think, able to, uh, or they have to be informed about this basic mythological background, even to appreciate the, the, the satire of these catfish prints. I, and I didn't really, as far as I, I, I was able to, you know, uh, uh, understand from the images that you sent me, you know, that aspect, that mythological aspect seemed to be absent in the 1920s uh, images. And it, it's more, I guess, directly political. Uh, I, I, I think these uh, images from the 1920s are sort of less, uh, less funny, uh, sort of it's meant to be, you know, I think the Edo prints, I mean, I, they were definitely thought made to be sort of humorous and, uh, um, uh, and sort of funny, comical almost. So, uh, so there is uh, this obvious continuity of the image of the catfish, but also there are, I think, I, I also noticed that there are significant differences in, in the sort of the background, uh, I guess, ambiance or the background uh, framework in which the catfish was being appreciated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I would definitely agree with you on that score that it is really more taken into modernity critique and, and a political uh, wielding of this allegorical symbol, but I, I think it does rest on a long history of this literacy, mythological literacy in its relevance and, and that it must be still percolating at the uh, collective imagination level, which is, is really interesting to think over so many decades that it still continues to be such a prevalent kind of um, mythological symbol there. Mm -hmm. um, and you did bring up humor and that's kind of brings me to my next question, which um, is, is this role of satire, which, and satire is, it, it's, it can be biting satire, which is what a lot of Edo humor was. It was incredibly, uh, it could be body, but also very cutting and, and very political in its own way, as, as you've pointed out in many examples here, that there, there was quite a lot of pushback on um, different kinds of excesses and corruptions, even if it wasn't trying to topple the bakufu itself. And, um, and that's certainly something we see in, in 23. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the role of satire and also its connection to violence, uh, because a lot of these, uh, of course, earthquakes are incredibly destructive. 
Um, they are destroying world systems and Yonaoshi itself can be quite destructive and violent. And some of the, the movements that you describe in the book, uh, some of them are um, a, a kind of, um, they're exuberant and almost have a kind of, as you said, messianic quality, but uh, some of them are, are just violent uprisings and have a, a, just a kind of destructive, let's take down the, the local boss kind of quality to them. So this connection between satire and violence um, it would be really is I think is really interesting. Yes. So I, I th there are many cases where yes the, the Yonaoshi uh, uh, discourse or conception is used to legitimize uh, violent violent acts, um, and that happens I think in, both in relation to uh, and uh, non in relation to you know the the rea the, the use of satire. The Catholic is, is an example where this deadly natural disaster is sort of humorized through this rather comical image of a catfish, right? And I think it what allows for that is sort of the uh, uh, sort of I don't know how to put it, but the, the the valence of catfish as an animal. Originally, I found out that originally the the animal that was supposed to cause earthquakes uh, was the dragon, but in the Edo period through the sort of the high kai satirical humor that symbolism gradually switched to to the catfish to this you know sort of this more mundane animal so, uh, so there, there there are different ways in which you know satire is produced and is um, connected to to violence but in the case of peasant protests uh, for example um, it, it really depends too because the earlier uprising in fact in, in the late 18th century um, people were deified as Yonaoshi gods more for making, you know, personal sacrifices because some of the leaders of these earlier protests would be arrested for organizing the protest, they would be executed, and for their sacrifice, the community members would gather together to commemorate them as Yonaoshi gods. So in that case, the Yonaoshi doesn't really function as a, as a scheme to legitimize violence, but it does more to sort of commemorate people's sacrifice. For their community, but in later uprisings, for example, in the 1830s, the discourse of Yonawa should get it does get used to legitimize uh, violent acts. I am a Yonawa Shikami, therefore I have the authority to you know do, to do these things that uh, I would otherwise not not have. So uh, I think individual contexts still matter, uh, but in certain instances, yes, I do see the the connection between satire satire and and um, violence, but the, the way in which that particular relation is manifest, I think it, it really differs in every, every context. Okay, thank you. Gideon, you wanna take it back? Uh, yes, yeah, so let me ask uh, one more question and we have a couple of questions already in the queue and, and so we'll turn it over to the audience after, after this question. So Takashi, in your last chapter, as you outlined a moment ago, you discussed the new religion, Omoto's visions of its international mission in the world which cast yeah. Japan as prototype of the world and its islands as corresponding to other nations. So I, I think you do a really nice job of uh, outlining the doctrines of the, the golden uh, deity of the Northeast and, and the teachings of the leaders and how they relate to you know, some of Japan's modern uh, wars and, uh, and such. But can you elaborate further on how Omoto leaders and their followers understood Japan's military victories and subsequent colonial expansion even while Omoto was collaborating with other religious organizations across the Asian continent. Uh, yes. So yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the question. And so, yes, Omoto's uh, millenarianism, uh, didn't really talk about this in the presentation, but, but it, its vision of the world transformation was based on this notion that, yes, Japan was the prototype of the world. It was the first country that was created by the gods and all the other countries in the world were created sort of modeled after Japan, basically is the argument that um, uh, Omoto uh, makes, right? And so what happens is that, you know, Omoto is very, very uh, active about using this language of universalism that, you know, my, our religion is about uh, sort of uh, achieving universal peace and we are all brothers and we are all, you know, equal, right? But that language of egalitarianism was clearly based on this, mm, yeah, this eth ethnocentric idea that Japan was sort of the first among equals or something. That the Japanese race had this um, 
mission, the sort of divinely sanctioned mission of sort of unifying the world. Uh, and the, the figure of the emperor, in fact, plays a, a really important role in the writings of the leaders of Omoto, basically upholding the emperor as the divinely sanctioned uh, unifier of the world. So there are ways in which Omoto's mythology or theology directly feeds into you know, Japanese expansionist agendas very clearly. Um, and then to go back to the idea of Japan being the, the, the prototype, you know, uh, there was this uh, essay or uh, conception uh, by one of the leaders of Omoto, uh, Dekuchi Onisaburo, who argued that, um, you know, all the Japanese islands, if you look at them, look very similar to all the world major continents. Right, so Hokkaido kind of looks like North America. Honshu looks like the Eurasian continent. Uh, Australia looks kind of, uh, Shikoku looks like, like Australia. Everybody knows that, right? Um, and Kyushu looks like the African continent. So this notion of mapping Japan onto the world was very, very active, uh, very central to Omoto's uh, theology uh, concerning, you know, this world unification or world transformation. Uh, so yes, so there, so there are ways in which the Omoto's theology could have been used to legitimate, legitimize the expansionist agendas of modern Japan. Uh, but we also have to recognize that Omoto was heavily persecuted by the Japanese government. Their sort of, their idiosyncratic mythology uh, was not uh, accepted by, you know, the Japanese state. And there are all kinds of reasons why, you know, Omoto was targeted in particular uh, uh, for, to be persecuted by the, by the government. So I think it's useful to sort of separate the theological aspect of this and sort of the on the ground reality of how uh, Omoto as a religion was related to the Japanese state in the early 19 or in the early 1900s. Thank you. So, Right. Let us let us turn to the questions from the the audience. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I just got cut off by <laughs> by my internet. Uh, Jennifer, would you be able to read the first uh, first one? Yeah, sorry about that. Unmute myself. So the first question is: for, It says this is before your time period, but I wonder if you see a difference between calls for tokusei and yonaoshi as concepts. Okay. Tokusei and Yonaoshi has come. Tokusei, I assume, means like something like virtuous governance or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I think the, um, the these two ideas are very closely linked because what what allowed, for example, peasant uh, what legitimized thousands of peasant protests in the Tokuga period, for example, was this idea of Tokusei or Jinsei. This this idea that um, the government, in a sense, had an obligation to in, obligation to ensure stable livelihoods to peasants and villagers and townspeople who who work diligently, pay their taxes dutifully, and embody these personal virtues like frugality uh, and uh, uh, diligence. So it was the violation, uh, the break of the promise of tokse or the virtuous governance that. Uh, that in a sense, in a sort of in a direct, indirect way, way empowered uh, uh, the, the, the subjects or the ruled. So uh, in that sense, I think Tokse and Yonaoshi uh, is close to link, but I would also be interested in sort of the, the ethic and emic of Tokse as well. I mean, is that like, were they talking about it back then? Or is that one of those categories that uh, scholars came up with and sort of retrospectively applied onto the Tokuga period or, or earlier? And that kind of brings up the conversation you and I had earlier about divine punishment, Tenbatsu and Yonaoshi as well, whether those were always linked. And I, I was interested because um, it's, it's often linked in the modern period, but usually metaphorically, not so much as, as truly a divine intervention uh, or a divine punishment. And, and even up until uh, the, the governor of Tokyo, Ishihara Shintaro, even mentioning Tenbatsu for disasters. Um, as a kind of world rectification. So it's, it, but that may be more the, the etic uh, reading of it than, than anything. Um, so but yeah, but you know, the, the Yonaoshi discourse actually is uh, very, well, I shouldn't say very popular, but you, you sometimes see it coming up in, um, in certain political, you know, elements. Uh, I, I, in the conclusion of the book, I talk about um, 
this uh, prefectural governor's race, I think in Kyoto, and I think in 2013 or 2014, where one person ran on the platform of Yonaoshi Kyoto, <laughs> right? And what this person was talking about was not this, you know, you know, bringing the apocalypse to Kyoto. And that's not what, at all what this person was talking about. But he was talking about opposing, uh, you know, uh, raising of taxes, providing protection to uh, marginalized workers, and so forth. So there are ways in which, uh, you know, this idea still continues to manifest in contemporary Japanese society. And uh, actually, the Yonaoshi from the, my book ends in the 1920s. So the continuation of Yonaoshi into the, the sort of the, the interwar periods, the, war, the wartime Japan, and then, the, and then beyond would be, uh, would be interesting, I think. Absolutely. Gideon, shall I read the next one or you want to do the next oh, I, one? I can read it, yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so we're getting a lot of great questions. The next one is, hi, Takashi, great talk, by a great, uh, great talk about a great book. I'm curious about any potential connections you see between these Edo era Yonaoshi gods, especially your examples of people who were seen as fighting corruption and becoming gods, and some earlier examples of deification in Japan, like Tenjin, Sugawara no Michizane, or mm -hmm. Taira no Masakado. Yeah. Especially in the latter case, Taira no Masakado ends up becoming a folk hero, even worshipped as both a hero against the government and a god capable of natural disasters. Right. I know neither necessarily have the concept of world renewal present, but I'm wondering if you've traced any kind of historical development between these earlier deified figures and the ones you discussed from the Edo period. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for that great question. Yes, so, so I, I have uh, thought about the, uh, you know, something I didn't do in this book, but I, I, I am aware of sort of the genealogy of people who, uh, who get deified for uh, their great deeds or this sort of, you know, superhuman uh, actions or sacrifices that they, that they make while alive. And you know, after they pass on, they get deified uh, as um, as kami, right? So I didn't really sort of trace that lineage or the the tradition that tradition in the book itself. But it, it is in fact something that I'm interested in working on for my uh, for my next project. In fact, uh, I, I'm trying to think uh, uh, look at cases where, you know, in in one of my chapters, I look at cases where there are these peasants who who get deified as Yonaoshi gods because of their participation in peasant protests. And I think this is a pattern that, uh, that is quite um, unique, I, you know, I, I, I might say to the early modern period, period in, in the sense that there are these you know, ordinary villagers who are getting deified, right? Taira no Masakaro, Sugaro no Michizane, these are great warriors, great aristocrats, right? It, that seems to be the pattern in the medieval period where you know, you have these great figures becoming deified. But in the Tokugawa period, you have these ordinary villagers, peasants, uh, uh, gaining the ability to, to become gods, right? So, it, so, so there is continuity in, in, the, in the phenomenon of human deification, but I think there is something uniquely, perhaps early modern about the fact that there are these yeah, ordinary people uh, going through the process of apotheosis or deification. So that is something that I will address in a future project, yes. So, uh, so thank you. The next question is from an anonymous attendee, and it's a little bit more about your intervention uh, uh -huh. in the project uh, in terms of if the characterization of Yonaoshi as a millenarian phenomenon is problematic, which it certainly sounds like it is, could you say a little bit about what forces shape the more traditional or familiar mischaracterization? Why the broader scholarly investment in seeing them in that way? Yes. Okay. That, that is a great question. And this is a question that I also um, uh, struggled with uh, in my earlier, in, in an earlier phase of this research, where I would read these, you know, books, you know, titled Yonaoshi, you know, something, right? Yonaoshi, no shiso, Yonaoshi undo, Yonaoshi iki. And then I would often pick up, you know, there's one, one great example is this one book by a scholar, you know, the really pioneering scholar of Yonaoshi studies named Shoji Kichinosuke. He wrote this book about Yonaoshi Ikki no Kenkyu, right? And then he would talk about these late Tokuga peasant protests that had these, uh, you know, in his eyes, revolutionary qualities, right? And he called them Yonaoshi uprisings. And, and, that, and he characterized these Yonaoshi uprisings as important precursors to the Meiji Restoration, uh, the rise of Japan as a democratic modern nation state and, and, and so forth. Uh, but uh, it took me a while to notice that 
if you actually go through his book, it's, it's him using the word Yonaoshi. If you go through the primary sources, none of the primary sources ever mentioned the word Yonaoshi, not even one time in his entire book, right? So once again, this, uh, this imposition of Yonaoshi as a scholarly category was, I think in part, uh, motivated by sort of the scholarly ethos of the times in the 60s and the 70s. People were interested in sort of going back to the Tokuga period, sort of finding the, the roots of democratic Japan or precursors of a democratic Japan. But where were the, where were the um, uh, sort of the, the, the seeds that made Japan's sort of, uh, you know, transformation into a modern democratic nation possible. You know, that, that retrospective gaze on, you know, Tokuga period often gets used for, for that kind of purpose, oftentimes going back and finding precedents, so to speak, and in, in a sense, making Tokuga peasants, peasant protests speak to uh, the, the, the moment of the 60s or the 70s, at least post-war, largely Marxist scholarship. I'm not saying that that, that scholarship was, was not important. It, it, it obviously has, has its own very important merits. But when it comes to the, again, the emic history of Yonaoshi, we have we really have to kind of put, put their scholarship on the side and uh, just kind of read the sources, right? And then the issue about millenarianism, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of trying to figure out who who the first person was who said um, in English uh, Yonaoshi was a millenarian concept. I wasn't able to sort of locate specifically. But the the, the funny thing is that. The association between Yonaoshi and millenarianism, once again, is something that we see in English language scholarship, mostly. No one is saying that in, mostly no one is saying that in Japanese. There's actually one scholar, Miyata Noboru, who's written a lot about Yonaoshi movements, who specifically says, we have no evidence of Yonaoshi Undo turning into millenarian movements in Japan. And why is that? That, that is actually a major question. So there is this discrepancy between what scholars are saying about Yonaoshi in Japanese language scholarship and what scholars in English have said about Yonaoshi and sort of connected it to the to, to millenarian uh, framework, right? So I wasn't really able to sort of dig into that histori historiography of uh, academia completely in the book, uh, but I hope it, the, the book helps to at least problematize that uh, association in the, once again, in the emic sense. All right, Takashi, uh, here's the next question. Uh, I am interested in the word agent you use in your title. Do you theorize at all agency in your book? And what is the relation between agency of the kami and of the people who identify the, deifi uh, who identify the deification? Is there a connection to criticism of Marxist historiography of millenarianism? I see. Agents, yes. Um, huh. I, okay, I haven't really thought about, okay. This is kind of embarrassing, but these agents of, why did I use that word? Um, I, I guess I am interested in the agency of you know, people who were using this, this particular expression. And that was in a sense, a way for me to um, highlight cases, historical actors who were uh, marginalized in the traditional, again, Marxist historiography of Yonaoshi because these people didn't really fit the rubrics of these, you know, historians writing about Yonaoshi movements in the ethic sense, right? Um, some of the examples that I talk about in this book are sort of, you know, they don't, they're not that exciting in terms of if you're interested in revolution, if you're interested in subverting the system, these are not people who were interested in subver subverting the system. I mean, they, they clearly had their own sort of more immediate, concrete economic needs in, in their everyday lives. They were worried about whether they had enough at the end of the month to pay their taxes or whether they could buy rice tomorrow. They weren't talking about, as far as I can tell, uh, sort of the, you know, sort of subverting the Tokuga region. None of those people were interested in that sort of question in, the, in, in that direct way. So in, in that sense, I am, I don't know, trying to highlight their agency, what they were interested in, these mundane concerns that were dismissed by the historiographies of, these you know, scholars who were interested in other things, uh, more uh, more noble goals in their mind, I guess, right? And then I, I didn't get to talk about it in the, in the presentation, but I do have a chapter on Asianica where Asianica is a particular, it's a perfect example of, uh, of an event where there is a real uh, tendency to associate Asianica, the phenomenon of, of Asianica with the sort of revolutionary millenarian 
uh, aspirations, part, partly because it happened right before on the eve of the major restoration. Tendency was to read it in terms of the major restoration. But I think that uh, approach does lead to a kind of teleological reading where everything leads up to the major restoration and things that don't lead up to the major restoration get dismissed as irrelevant or not important or insignificant. I take those mundane details very seriously and include them in the book, even when it doesn't help this teleology of things leading up to the Meiji Restoration, if that makes sense. And one of the things that really struck me about this story is about the mundane. And for many people, food food was not just mundane. It's a, it's a survival issue, but was that to become a DF a deity worthy uh, individual, you had to step out of the normal path of your role and, and, and do something that was an executable offense. And so to me, that's an extraordinary action that's and true. really represents individual agency. Um, and the fact that there was a mechanism to deify those individuals, even when they were vilified by the state is another really interesting way to think about it. it mm -hmm. It's it's a kind of afterlife salvation, which is um, symbolic for, as you said, for that sacrifice they make, because it is quite mm -hmm. an extraordinary action, even yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the Bakufu officials that you that you talk about. Um, and their, their concern for the people does resonate with a class politics yeah. of a Marxist I ideology. And I think that's where, where the etic um, overlays come in is that this, what seems like a a very modern sensibility of class concern uh, across the hierarchies from um, say a samurai retainer for for the peasants around him is, is something that resonates with with that kind of political ideology. Yes. Okay, no, th thank you. Thank you for the comment. Yes, so there are ways in which the etic and emic perhaps converge in, in, in interesting and different ways. And uh, uh, there is this absolutely the sense of the extraordinary that 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 people that people you know sort of in, people behaved and, and gained status as 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 you know, she gods in their respective circumstances, um, uh, but but that notion of the extraordinary sometimes doesn't fit what sort of you know what scholars are kind of looking for and, and the, the ways they like people to be extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes. Not to the extent of taking down the entire order. <laughs> That's right. 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 I, I, I have not seen, seen right. that evidence with regards to the emic conception of Yonosh. Right. Um, the next question is um, a, a little bit far afield according to the, the questioner here, but it's um, a, somebody, from somebody who studies popular culture in modern mm -hmm. Japan. And uh, he's wondering if you are familiar with the manga Death Note in which the son of a police officer, Yagami Light, is given a notebook by a Shingami, which allows Light to mark people for death. Uh -huh. And he does so with an increasingly misplaced sense of justice and has to be stopped by a kind of alter ego. Do you think Yo Naoshi discourse, as you discuss it here in emic terms, makes sense as an interpretive frame in that manga? Interesting. I, I know Death Note. I, have, I actually haven't read it, but it's like I know the, the general you know, scheme of the system or the assumption of the manga. Um, does you know? Yeah, in a sense, I mean, if this, if this, the, if the protagonist is is doing that, you know, you know, killing people based on his own sense of justice, I, I guess, in 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 his views, that that counts as you know, I think. Um, I I do wonder. I mean. Beyond the realm of politics, uh, Yonawashi does find appearances in sort of more popular cultural materials. I think uh, some of the period dramas, like Jidaigeki, for example, sometimes reference uh, Yonawashi. You know, there are these, um, you know, this uh, protagonists go on the, the journey of world renewal, Yonawashi no Tabi, rectifying evils in various communities, right? So, uh, yeah, that, that's a uh, that, that would be uh, an interesting uh, 21st century emic conception of Yonawashi if that's ever referenced in the manga itself, but I'm not, not too familiar with it myself. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Takashi. So the next question uh, is related to Buddhism. Yes. So is, is there any historical connection between the veneration of Yonawashi gods and Buddhist theology? Uh, ex example, the concept of Hongaku, uh, Buddha nature, Thank you so much. Again, it would oh. be great. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. 
Yes. Um, Buddhist theology, the concept of Pongaku, Buddha nature. Oh, okay. Well, I feel like I should have an answer for this because my advisor wrote uh, a whole book about Hongaku. <laughs> Let's see, it's connection to Buddha nature. I mean, um, I mean, I don't really see any, you know, direct explicit references to, you know, Buddhist uh, theological concept concepts in the sources that I, I, I looked at. Um, but in so far as the the, the 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 idea that you know anybody could become a kami, that everybody has the uh, uh, potentiality of becoming deified or acting in a noble way that uh, uh, warrants that the process of deification, perhaps there is a comparable or uh, interesting way in which there are certain conceptual analogs. But you know, there again, I, I don't really no one. Explicitly references these Buddhist concepts uh, in the sources that that I looked at, but I do. But this book does deal with qu uh, quite a bit with Buddhist institutions. Like you know, the, the first example that I looked at, you know, of Zenzaimon's deification happens within uh, a Buddhist uh, temple. But then, what complicates the factor is that this veneration the situation is that the, the veneration of Sano happens more or less spontaneously. So that seems more like a popular religion or non-institutionalized religion. So you know, the book is interesting in 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 showing that these two different aspects really exist in one coherent sort of organic, you know, place or uh, situatedness. Yeah. And just added, I wonder about the relationship to the future world of Maitreya Buddha, in terms yeah. of. That. Maitreya Buddha, yes, this this comes directly uh, a, um, in in relation to the Omoto theology because one of the leaders of Omoto, Deguchi Onisaburo, claimed to be Maitreya incarnate, right? That I am the Maitreya, the, the personification of Maitreya in in the modern world, right? So uh, the ideal world in in Omoto, the paradise on earth that is to emerge after all the destruction and of, of, of the corrupt world and the evil world is identified as the world of Maitreya, right? So it, I don't really see that, see, see reference to Maitreya in relation to Yonaoshi in the Tokuga period, but in, in, in the case of Omoto, the, the reference is pretty explicit, yeah. So the uh, potentiality of Maitreya as, as, a, as, a, as an apocalyptic symbol, symbolism is very much alive in early 20th century Japan, and maybe even today. Okay, uh, thank you. Here, the next question, uh, I would like to ask whether in relation to earlier vengeful spirits, such as Sugawara no Michizane, there is any sense that the Yonaoshi deifications might also have had a, a pacificatory function? Yeah, that, okay, that is also very interesting. That, that is a very, I think that's a very fruitful avenue to think about this. But I didn't really explore it in, in this book in particular. But yes, so thinking about Sano's example. But with, you know, with someone like Sano, the, the language that's used overwhelmingly in the sources that I looked at is the, is the language of gratitude. Uh, thank you for your sacrifice. And then you don't really hear about Sano as like, a, like an ondyo or something like that, or vengeful spirit, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, seeking vengeance on on the bakfu or something like that. I don't I don't really see anything like that. So I think you have to sort of look at the individual context and cases. Uh, but th that is a possibility. You know, I haven't I can't think of, it, of a concrete example. But you know, I I, 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 I can kind of see where you're going with this. I and it was something that I have to think about a little more thoroughly before I can give a concrete uh, answer. But that is certainly a possibility. Yes. Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat right now, but I thought I'll take an opportunity to ask one of my own. Um, sure. I'm really interested in world renewal as a universal theme, uh, thinking about uh, the Lisbon earthquake or any other a range of disasters where there's a, a rhetoric of, of world renewal and, and the global comparative context here. And I know you're very much invested in this particular specific historical context and how unique and, and specific that term terminology is. And I think you have to be really careful about overgeneralizing, but I just wondered about trying to put this in perhaps a more comparative context, what would be the benefits of doing that um, 
rather than say perhaps that it's incommensurable to any right. other kind of right. um, world system. Mm -hmm. Now that that that's a very you know, uh, of course, a legitimate question, and then you know, I think a fruitful way, fruitful way to think about this. Um, the, I mean, world renewal is essentially about. Uh, it is about change, ultimately. You know, recognizing the status quo as uh, somewhat unfulfilling, in some ways constraining, contradictory, and the the these world renewing gods. Their function was to rectify that to so to but then the drive i think in these world renewing gods in the tokuga period period at least is to sort of rectify them back to the way they're supposed to be right so it's not like let's create something new and it's not like let's take down the tokugawas and sort of you know to create a new world order i that's we i don't really see that in in, in the yonawashi gods it's it's sort of it's more of a i guess a I don't want to say a cyclical or circular argument. Like you know, the, there is this ideal that that is supposed to be the way things the way the way things are. But you know, there are these evil entities that are um, uh, disrupting or com complicating uh, the sort of the fruition of this ideal, and we have to remove those entities, right? So um, if if people are sort of uh, looking for again uh, kind of revolutionary ideas in the sort of in our sense today, you know, they might, they might find uh, the Tokugawa examples a little dissatisfying or sort of not, not exactly sort of up to, you know, up to par or something. Um, but, but that, but that's sort of, uh, but that's also a sort of a kind of a limited approach too. I mean, there's nothing wrong with sort of appreciating what they were trying to do at the time on their own terms. So uh, with that caveat, I think, yes, there is, a, there is room for comparative analysis. Um, uh, but I, I think that has to be done with a certain sense of, uh, I don't know if, if humility is the right word, but certain sense of awareness that um, historical actors don't always act in the way that we want them to act. I mean, that's not, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm struck in certain similarities, particularly with the Catholic church, the way it uses the divine as this external, a social critique particularly um, from the clerical side vis-a-vis -vis the, the secular religious, uh, secular ruling side. And, and I see this here, this, this using of the, the value of, of a spiritual deity and a moral rectitude to, to critique um, those kinds of terrestrial types of things. And, and so that kind of relationship and the way of, 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 of reinstating that proper idea of the right to rule, of proper rule, is through this external um, divine vision that, that is unassailable in some ways. I, I'm, not, I'm surprised that more people weren't being deifying themselves on a daily basis. How do you, <laughs> uh, I, I loved your discussion about how people are, you know, kind of just, a, a tag you're you're a deity now they're tagging people to become deities and and taking that role on so it's really interesting how it's used very that's where i saw the the term agents in a very decisive way and very yeah. specific way okay no thank you that, that that's a that's a much better answer to that question about agents than, than what i was able to <laughs> but, but i agree yeah oh, oh. i'm told that i can ask one more question um uh, so uh, I'm sure this past year, I mean, with your book coming out, has been very exciting. Can you share a little bit about the reception and how, how that's been? Oh, yes. So, uh, well, I'm just, I was just thrilled that the book came out finally last year. And so I was like, I, 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 I at that point I was like, oh, I don't, I don't care what people say about the book. I'm just, I'm just happy it's done. But then, but then the, yes, reviews have come in and, you know, uh, uh, beyond the, the, the two peer reviewers for the manuscript. And then, well, th thank you, Gideon, for you know writing a very nice review about the book. And then, uh, I'm I'm glad and I'm, I'm happy that uh, historians find this book in, uh, useful or interesting because I'm a religious studies uh, student uh, person by training. Uh, but then, you know, I, uh, all the reviews that have been written so far, book reviews, have been written by sort of uh, historians. Uh, so I'm glad that the book is finding perception among you know people outside of my immediate field of religious studies uh maybe uh, I, maybe religious studies people aren't paying attention to the book i don't know uh because maybe because you know this book it's really hard for me to describe this book like you know uh i've always been jealous of people who can say things like oh i study 
you know, Buddhism in like medieval Japan or something, you know, I study big category of religion, time period, country, name. you know, some, you know, this book is really hard to describe in that sense. Um, is it about Buddhism? Is it about Shinto? Is it even about, you know, religion, you know, that, so, it, so this book is weird in its own, in, in that sense. Uh, but uh, in terms of reception, I'm glad that uh, people beyond the field of religion has uh, have so far found it uh, useful and meaningful, in including uh, including uh, you both. Well, thank you. I see the book appearing there on screen. We've covered a lot of ground from print culture to world renewal and satire and Jidaigeki and pacification and social critique and more. Um, so I'm really grateful to Professors Mihira and Fujiwara and Weisenfeld for joining us today.